So uh, first of all, let me let me get this going so I don't speak for too long because that is something that has a tendency to happen. Um, and uh, thank you to to Ben to the academies uh, for having me here today. So I'm going to start with sort of an overview of why we do what we do at Sage, um, and then go through some examples of our work. I'm not going to be doing this as a sales pitch. We're a nonprofit. We don't have products that we sell. But I think that there are there's value in looking at specific scientific problems and solutions and seeing what we can generalize from those things. Um, but I wanted to start with a little sense of why we do what we do. And the big one is that, that we think we're in a moment now that is you know, similar to the post-World War II moment in science policy, uh, but where science policy is moving more and more towards openness, collaboration, integration, and sharing, but we're not really examining how those pushes move us towards methodological change. So uh, I'd love to start with the quote. It's always fun because no one knows where the quote actually came from. Uh, which is interesting. It's not Mark Twain. The earliest citations you can find of this actually only go back to the 70s, um, which is an interesting thing we think about as we move towards digital science. Will we even be able to go back 30 or 40 years and find out why decisions were made and who actually said what? Um, when you look at post-World War II policy, a lot of it comes from Vannevar Bush, right? So both from his report on Science the Endless Frontier, which sort of argued for uh, you know, generic in, uh, government investment. It, in many ways, it led to the creation of the tech transfer industry, the system. Um, and this is really where we've been going. And I love the report itself. If you've never read it, it's kind of amazing. Um, it's this argument about frontierism, uh, which is that science should be going out and, and, and finding these frontiers. And it really drove the way we set up the NSF and a lot of the, of the stuff we think of now as sort of unchangeable institutions. Um, and I look at the public access policy and the Holdren memo on access to data and publications as in many ways in the same spirit as trying to, to reach the frontiers of the internet and actually use them effectively. We don't have a sort of a unitary document like Bush's document because we live in a different world now. Um, but we've in many ways made as big of a change with the push towards open data and open publications um, as, as you can find in many other decades of science policy after World War II. Um, the other piece that Bush wrote around this time period was, was also influential, as we may think. Uh, this was the piece where he really envisioned the modern internet. And I love some of the quotes in it, so I'm going to you know, put these up while we think about them. I would argue this is still true, um, that we are, we are still basically publishing papers. We're just using digital versions of papers. Uh, PDFs were not created to be interoperable, ontological, and all the things that you just heard. Um, they're for people to compress knowledge and send it around to each other. Um, and in many ways, he envisioned the internet, which he called the Memex, as the original way that you would navigate better than just by reading paper to paper. Um, and these are three visions for how such networks can be, uh, from the old uh, Larry Barron packet switching and at work in the 60s. Um, another quote, uh, this is a PowerPoint interoperability fail. Um, <laughs> But this, this idea that the way that we navigate is the same way that we navigated in the ways of square rigged ships, right? Through documents mailed in paper, and we should be able to navigate through links. Um, we've tr sort of done this for documents, right? That's what the web was in many ways, was, was, was realizing the potential of this, but for documents. Um, it doesn't work for data. Have you ever followed a hyperlink to a data point? Right? And even if you follow a hyperlink to a data set, Right? No matter how open and fair that data set is, um, you've got to spend a lot of time and work bringing that data in unless it's a very, very basic data set. So for any average biological data set, the best we can do is, is make sure to say, this is worth your paying attention to. Because it means it's going to take you a couple of weeks to take it, integrate it, learn it, and use it. It's not like following a link to a document that you can read. And so part of the argument we have at Sage is that we need a data network. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about why we think that's forming now and that talking about it as a network and thinking about the principles of that network are really important. Um, this is the choice that was originally made for interneting large computers, right? A distributed network where, not, where no node had lots of connections. And this would make the system relatively robust against random knockout of any of the computers on the system. Computers at the time weren't that reliable. The phone connections weren't that reliable. The data connections were thin, right? But there was no barrier on moving to a hub-and-spoke network, which is what happened 
sort of when I got onto the internet, I think 1992 was the first time I got onto an, a connected computer outside of a library. Um, and this is the world that we moved towards. But, you know, this original system where you just had a few academics with computers, right, leads inevitably to the hub and spoke network formation again inside itself. And when you don't put any boundaries on node aggregation, you get the world we live in now, which is basically Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Baidu, a uh, couple of other companies that together form technology stacks that dominate the vast majority of our online experiences. Right, so that's what happened with a completely open, unrestricted network. Um, and so we didn't set out to get centralized networks, but we actually wound up with centralized networks. And maybe we're going to be in phases where we constantly oscillate between centralized and decentralized networks, because this also looks a lot like 1989 when we had you know, America Online and Prodigy and CompuServe dominating and mediating the online experience. And what that did was create the appetite for going back to a decentralized system where we actually had some freedom and we had some protection and some rights and some agency. So this is the opportunity in data networking is just, just quite literally and intentionally say, how do we connect right, the data silos? But it requires us to ask right, very, uh, very intentionally what kind of network are we going to build? Because we're not just building commonses. Or if we just build commons, as we won't achieve any of the benefits of network effects. So we need to be talking about what kind of network we want to build and taking some of the lessons from the last couple of years about the network effects of the networks that we built in culture. Because science and culture are deeply connected. It's likely that we'll have whatever pathologies culture has unless we literally build it differently. So at Sage, you know, we, we got founded to explore this space. We spun out of Merck uh, in 2009 as a nonprofit, um, as sort of the big data and analytics group that was doing large-scale mouse profiling at Merck. And the sense was, you know, we, we, want, we want to go figure out where openness and collaboration actually work in practice, not sort of advocate for it in theory. Um, and we saw that from the beginning as having three components. So you have team science, where you have groups working in, in, in sort of uh, items larger than just laboratories what we call open science. And so this would be things where the data is open and the practice is open and the notebooks are open and is a little more radical than just networking laboratories into teams. And then also saying, what happens if we bring normal people into it, right? Either as data generators or data analysts or data curators. Um, keeping with this idea, we don't do uh, advocacy-based work. We try to say, what would a specific pilot project that tests a concept look like? Can we solve a specific scientific problem um, against traditional incentive metrics uh, better than a traditional approach to the scientific problem? Right? Is our ability to bring new methods and technologies able to let us compete on the old rules? Because we think that's the only way to really break out. Can we generalize the results of those pilots into infrastructure and offer those back as public utilities? Uh, we do need to make some revenue. Cloud isn't free, especially if you're pay talking about compute. Right, one of the dirty secrets of cloud is storage is cheap, but usage is still very, very expensive. Um, so we try to actually provide infrastructure and subsidize that out to scientists because every transaction cost between a scientist and a culture change in their scientific methodology prevents scientists from adopting it. So cost, time, training, all of those are things that we have to subsidize. And when we're successful, we actually support a community. And a community to us is when someone who is not funded and in a mandate to work this way voluntarily signs up to work with it. That's when we know we've made a jump from people who are only doing it because they're required to do it under the policy changes that have emerged uh, to where people have seen an independent incentive to join it as scientists. So here's you know, a couple of examples. So uh, the Alzheimer's uh, Disease Accelerating Medicines Partnership at the NIH. This is a public-private pharmaceutical NIH project recognizing that although we have targets for Alzheimer's disease, when we hit drugs on those targets, they don't affect Alzheimer's disease, which is obviously suboptimal. So what the, the idea is let's fund six radically different scientific approaches to target discovery within Alzheimer's disease. They're all looking at the brain. They're all looking at the same sorts of pathways. But they're pursuing very different biological hypotheses in this connected space. Fund them to work in the same technical environment from day one, coordinate them as they move from being individual laboratories to being a network that, that researches this, and have a rolling 90-day data portal where you release data, code, analytic models, pseudocode, everything that's needed to replicate the analysis that's been done. 
So it's, this is too complicated for any one institution to do, and the experts in Alzheimer's disease are not experts in collaborating and making their data available. Um, that's the part that we play. So these are the kinds of things that we are funded to do, some of which we subsidize, some of which we have direct funding to do. Um, and the idea is that the network is not going to magically form on its own. The scientists, in many cases, have to be coordinated and brought along. Um, and even though the RFA said they were going to have to act like this and the contracts required them to act like this, there still had to be some sticks used at the end of year one. Interestingly, sort of in the middle of year two, you see the leap from where the people who are being the most difficult start to see benefit. And in year three, they start training the people coming in. And so this coordination actually fades over time. But you know, we actually have to, at the beginning, go through the grants themselves, find the specific aims, and be matchmakers. And say, you know, Margaret, your specific aim one, and John, your specific aim five, share common elements. What assets do you have that you're using to explore that aim? Can they be shared? Next phone call, who's the postdoc who manages that asset in your lab? Get them talking to the postdoc in the other lab. Next phone call saying, how do you curate the data? What's the social context in your laboratory of that data? And by the time they've actually got that up and running, 90% of the work required to make the data reusable has been done for that person for that specific incentive. And it's that level of intervention that we've had to, to go with again and again and again because the methods that you have to adopt to use cloud, collaborative, open systems are so different than the methods that people are trained into. And we often don't bake this into the expectations. And so these are the, the stepwise function. We don't go straight to open. Um, we go through these periods of, of sort of bohemia or private phases because in many cases exposing science early can chill the hypothesis diversity during the formation phase. And we've found this over and over and over in challenges in communities. There's a real value to allowing sort of a private phase as long as there's an automated transfer to the open phase. So the key is working in the same environment technically in the closed phase that you work in in the open phase, and all you have to do is change file permissions. But going straight to that can have these weird network effects that we don't necessarily want. Um, and this is what we keep finding is that if you move to these cloud systems, what we're going to create is yet more silos. Uh, because what the cloud makes it easy to do is to rent a cheap silo to stick your data where it's expensive to move it out. It's actually worse than a data center that you control in a lot of ways because it feels cheap, but then your data is locked at Amazon. And you have to spend an enormous amount of money to actually do anything with it. And every time someone else touches your data, it costs you money. Right? So this, when we think about the internet of data, we're going to think about both how do we connect all of these things, but do we really want to have our stuff outsourced all the time? So that's an example of something we did where the funders mandated it. We, we wanted to see if we could replicate this where we sort of did this voluntarily. So colorectal cancer subtyping, four papers, six months, four journals, four different subtypes, four different data sets, four different algorithms. So after some shuttle diplomacy, we convince them to share their data. We say each of you gets to write a paper as lead author on the collected data that is uh, collated, and we'll collectively write a consensus paper and build a consensus molecular subtype. Same concept, right? Uh, you go from being these individuals generating different subtypes to where each group can use the collected data. That creates the incentive to get them to actually start sharing and collaborating. Right? And we start to find the actual consensus subtypes when we put all the data together that none of them would have been able to see individually. Um, and that paper makes it into Nature Medicine. So you start to say, does the science get better if we start to adopt these methods? And there starts to be visible evidence under pre-existing metrics. Because a lot of the open innovation and open collaboration expects magical metrics to start working at tenure and review. And the reality is we think that Hacking those metrics first is the way to get the new metrics in. You're not going to get simple replacement. Um, what we were doing was basically mainly helping powerful scientists who already got money from NIH. So we decided to start working in challenges and crowdsourcing. Um, there were already lots of well-funded companies, one of them just bought by Google, that find you the outlier algorithm, right? the most sort of maximized version. We don't like that as much. We prefer building a, the consensus algorithm out of the top sets of finishers in a challenge and saying, here's an open source benchmark that you need to get above if you want to claim validity in this field. Um, a lot of those outliers are hard to replicate over time. Uh, but you can do an enormous amount by creating benchmark open source analytic models 
uh, and then distributing those as tools. Uh, we've done this in prostate cancer. Uh, we've done this in digital mammography. We've done it in single cell parameter estimation. And so we're sort of consistently trying to push out these, these challenges and say, can we create an open source consensus methods that journals can use, that regulators can use, that governments can use? Um, as we got into this, it was clear that if we didn't, every time we tried to change a piece of the cycle, the cycle healed around us. So like, and, and I've seen this before, right? It's, it's, it's a very sort of integrated ecosystem in science. And so we actually had to go all the way to data collection and generation under our own terms to use our methods at scale. Because despite all of our community work, most of the data can't go from one community to another because of the way it was collected or consented. Uh, we can't put lots of cool data into challenges because it wasn't properly consented. So we got into running our own clinical studies a few years ago as a last you know, desperate measure, more or less. Um, and here's one of the reasons visually why it's attractive in the life sciences. So this is a church in Detroit, holds 2,000 people. Uh, I spent like a day looking for pictures of buildings that contained exactly 2,000 people because that's the size of the largest Parkinson's longitudinal observational study before we got into the space. Right, this is an incredibly small number of people. It's not as small as the 38 people who study justified hydrocodone and oxycodone uh, distribution at scale. We make multi-billion dollar decisions on sample sizes that are embarrassingly small. Right, the entire study fits in the church. Not only that, they gather data in person once per year and twice a year by phone or survey. And this is how we create diagnosis guidelines and treatment guidelines for the entire country. Let's not even get into the demographics of the 2,000 people not looking like the actual demographics of this country. And so this has led the technology industry to embrace mobile health, right? And so these are the official uh, cool-looking graphs, right? Um, and the whole concept is that we can reach out to you where you live on a regularized basis. Um, and there's 200 million Americans with these smartphones. We're looking at demographic penetrations up into sort of the 75 to 80 percent of every major demographic group over time. And that just keeps accelerating over the next couple of years. The, the, the most recent Pew data, um, phone usage is one of the most demographically flat things you can find. Right, social media usage, you name it, all of these things are just screaming up to the right. So you can actually reach out and touch people because the same sensors that make these phones very effective at selling you frozen pizza, make them effective at tracking you from a health perspective. And so we were fortunate, we partnered with Apple. Uh, it's not Apple's practice to partner with open source nonprofits, but they did. Um, to create this framework for medical research, we were able to convince them to open source the thing. And what it means is that if you wanna build a medical research app on an iPhone, you don't start from scratch. Apple has released an endorsed open source app framework that lets you stand one of these things up quickly. Um, we've been very fortunate to work with uh, directly running some of these studies ourselves and also creating cloud services that subsidize them in an ethical manner. Um, this is the one that we run uh, that, that we like the most to talk about, which is Empower and Parkinson's. Um, so this gives you a sense of the scale of enrollment in the first six months compared to the church. And this is just with, you know, found marketing. I mean, we got a little boost out of the Apple launch event, um, but, you know, they were, people were mainly focused on the whole Game of Thrones part of the Apple launch event and not the whole mobile health research consent thing. Um, but we got this remarkable cohort. And what we can do is we can use the same sensors that do landscape and portrait, do things like measure tremor. Right? We can have those go into your pocket and measure your gait. We can do phonation. We can do dyskinesia and tapping on the phone. And even better, we can do it before and after meds every day. And so you get this incredible explosion in dimensionality as well. So it's not just the raw number of taps or a qualitative scale of one to five. You can literally find people where the same medicine's having a different impact that was invisible. So like, this is a guy that we would have caught the old way because although you can't read it, the top numbers are his number of taps. Right? Well, here we have a woman where the number of taps is right there in the middle. It's not significant. Her accuracy is improving. Same medicine, different impact. One would have been invisible under the old way of seeing. One becomes visible. You can also see the sort of the lived experience. This is one person over time. Each of these is a day, right? A red line's a good day. The red line's a day where the bottom is the taps before meds and the top is the taps after meds. A blue is a bad day and these other points are intermediate days. And so what we have is a clinical hypothesis where things are pretty good 
and stable. Things are pretty good and stable. And something happened. Right? Again, invisible under the old ways of doing this. This is why everyone's racing towards this. Right? But methodologically, how do you deal with 22,000 unstructured text comments? How do you integrate these? When people say, you know, coffee makes me feel good. The news makes me feel bad. We have a persistent cluster whose sensor data drops off a cliff when they report watching cable news. Right? And methodologically, what do we do? Do we tell them to stop watching the news? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, that puts us in the FDA regulation bucket. Uh, but what we can do is provide them back their data, formatted in a way that allows them to draw conclusions precisely like that. But you can't do that if your methodology assumes that your participants are just data from data farms from which you get data. If they're someone you have a relationship with, then you can actually give them the data. Say, look, here's what led up to your bad days, and here's what led up to your good days. Right? But you have to think of them differently, and your methods have to integrate them. And this gets even harder as you scale out to all the data types that Margaret talked about in her intro. Right? As we go out to EHRs and you know biobanking and direct to consumer genomics and you know, wearables tracking you everywhere, right? You start to look like Pigpen and the old peanuts where you just, but you're just throwing off data, <laughs> right? And again, methodologically, how do, everything we've built and trained towards assumes 2,000 people, three data point, three data collection moments per year, right? They're not ready for fire hoses and harnesses and notebook-based approaches, which is how we do data outside of the life sciences. Right? The nice thing is it's not, much, it's not as enclosed. Right? You just have to make informed consent happen. This is one of the oldest extant c consent forms from the Yellow Fever archives at, at UVA. This is the translation of the Spanish document. It's actually very progressive for its time. Uh, it told them that they might die, and it offered them money. Um, for 19, like, 1903, this is super progressive. Um, when you study consent, you see it has all sorts of problems, right? No one understands it or has time to read it or has the ability to change the formatted document. It's, it's written to meet regulatory requirements, not ethical requirements. It doesn't do any informing. It's all about consent. And so when you go onto a phone, it gets worse, right? We, we, we don't read on screens the same way we read in print. We read one out of three words physically based on empirical studies of eye scanning, uh, reading count time, right? Even if... You, you thought you did, right? You still have to say, are we going to actually design? And I'm missing a slide. I apologize when I clean this up. Uh, we, we also click OK on documents that are between us and our goals on our phones, right? It's a side effect of click wrap culture. So if you want to do consent on a phone, right, you've got to actually treat it as a design problem and introduce friction if you want to be somewhat informing. And so we've developed this process that Apple also baked into Research Kit where we literally uh, adopt the primary methodology from web journalism of picture, headline, subheadline. If the picture is related to the headline, the eye gaze fixation slows down to the same speed as print. We don't know why, we just know that it works. So we've adopted this, lets you build a, a visual narrative of the study. Um, this is now required for all of Apple's Research Kit apps. Uh, we've pushed this out into Android, and it's the basis of the All of Us Research Program's consent approach as well, uh, for which we're the awardee. Um, we let people decide if they want to donate their data to science. One of the big problems we have when we did the surveys is people assumed that the clinical scientists were sharing their data. They were kind of pissed off to find out that they weren't. Um, this is a tax we impose for access to our cloud infrastructure. Anyone who wants our cloud infrastructure has to offer this as a choice. 70% stably across all the studies we support elect to donate their data to science. Uh, we put that data out before we even analyzed it. So we, we released the first six months uh, before we ever published our first paper of the analysis. Um, this is what it looks like to enable that. So we actually had to do a visual consent that says, here's what it means to let people see your data going forward. Right? We're going to share it with qualified researchers. We're not going to just put it on the internet. Uh, we've seen the negative externalities of letting random anonymous people use things all the time. Uh, so the people who want to use the data have to pass a test, validate their identity, file a data use statement, and download, print, sign, scan, and upload this oath of ethical data usage. If we could, if I had gotten what I wanted, they would have had to do a YouTube video where they swore it with their hand up. Uh, but we didn't quite get there. We may get there for the All of Us program. Um, everyone gets to see the uses. We feed these back to the, to the study participants. We give away everything that we did in this as an open source tool with nothing more than an attribution requirement so that other people can build off of the visual library of hundreds of icons that we built. 
We give away the design layouts in PSD format because designers need those. Software workflows because your app developer generally starts collecting data the minute the phone's installed, sorry, the, the app is installed on the phone, not the moment consent has happened. You have to fix all of these pieces methodologically or people keep making little errors as they jump into the system and they, they add up all the way to the way that you do your advertising on the web to make sure that you have the right requirements. All these things are available as open source tools. Um, so that's 100,000 plus enrolled in our studies in three years. Um, we know of 26 methods outside of our studies that, that, have, that have grabbed the methods and, and used them. Um, and we've been able to affect you know, the world's largest lifestyle brand. So to, to close it, um, we think that this, this is going into the All of Us program. This is a unique program because it's a study as a platform. It'll allow for lots and lots of sub-studies to happen very quickly. Um, oh, I didn't realize I had these builds in it. I hate builds. Sorry, let me get these as fast as I can. Um, the whole point of this is to make this the largest bio, uh, bio, biological data set that's easy to access and to make it easy to integrate. And so there is an explicit place for environmental and exposure data to feed into this data system. So anyone that has ideas about environmental data to bring in, come talk to us. Um, this is exactly where the study was designed to go and the clinical protocol explicitly not only supports it but requires that we support it. And just for a visual sense, these are the funded medical center enrolling sites that will be live within the next couple of months in national launch. These are the Walgreens locations that support the study. And uh, as we move out to sending vans that can go visit and do the biospecimen and physical exam, this is the, the, the physical coverage of the study. And the one thing I'll say to sort of close out is what I showed for our consent we think works when we know what the teachable risks and unknowns and benefits are. For things like results return of giving people back their whole genome sequences or the impact of pharmacogenomics, we're going to be looking at different interactions that are more provocative and less teaching. Uh, because we don't want to know, do you know what the letters D and N A stand for? We want to know if you understand that in many ways the benefits and risks of knowing your DNA results are unknowable at the time that you see them. And you will learn about them by being part of the study. So we're looking at provocations where we give people 10 statements and say, how do these make you feel? Uh, and then give people a score back and say, based on your answers, you're this comfortable, are you sure you want to go forward? We're looking at demonstrations where we give them the entire report, but with a, um, a conversational gene like cilantro or photic sneeze reflex. And they can explore and learn about genetic penetrance without learning about their cancer risks. Uh, but we think we need to keep moving and thinking about consent as a set of interactions, not as a legal barrier to be crossed if we want this to work, because at the end of the day, the person you're studying is the one who can connect their environmental exposure, diet, electronic health record, right? It's that person. And if we want to build something that competes with the Googles and the centralized systems of the world, we've got to create a system that they want to buy into for science, not just for advertising. Because we don't have the sort of money and scale to smooth out the user experience the way that they do, and we never will. What we can offer them is an honest, ethical, engaged experience um, that treats them like a partner in the things that they want to study and care about. So here's how to contact me. Please feel free to do so. And thanks again for the chance to be here. So we, we have about 10 or so minutes for questions. If anybody wants to ask John any, go ahead. Can, can you check your mic? I think it's. I can shout. No, I can just, good. it's fine. Let well, me. Webcast. It's for oh. people on the webcast. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Um, the question that I have is with the change in the Apple pricing construct, where now you have to pay for your Apple phone straight out, um, are you seeing that that is changing your socioeconomic status of your participants because of this change? We haven't seen that yet, but we also haven't launched a major new study since that change happened. We do expect that to happen. Um, we have already branched out into Android, and uh, we're looking forward to having a big year in Android this year. Um, Apple is great for a variety of reasons. One is the hardware sort of standardization. The other is that they're a very privacy-forward company compared to the other big tech stacks. Uh, but realistically, if we're not an Android, we're not touching vast pieces of the, of, the, of the population. And so a big chunk of what the All of Us program is going to do is lead to this sort of complete dual-use framework uh, that's you know, web, Android, iPhone, 
Uh, so you can hit all three of those modalities at the same time. And I think that's where, that's where everyone wants to be. Um, it's a really, and we, if, this could be like, I, I could talk for 30 minutes on just this topic. So if you want to talk more in the hall, grab me. But like the, there's an enormous amount of, of difficulty in figuring out how to repurpose these things for health without really exposing the users. Um, and if you look at it as a very simplistic example, the Strava heat mapping example that revealed, you know, patrol routes in Afghanistan mm -hmm. is a great example of how good intentions, right, lead you a really, can lead you to really dark places. And so we try to be very cautious about that. Um, and, and it starts with the actual hardware, but it, it goes all the way through to your software design as well. So um, the good news is, is I think that you're going to see some major moves in Android this year that we haven't seen in the past years. Uh, I think it took a while for folks to catch up. Hang on, do this one, then come back to you. Melissa Perry, George Washington University. Really interesting talk, very eye-opening, what Sage Bio Networks does. Um, uh, because you've been working with so many uh, multi-site collaborations, I'm sure you're very aware that in academia, we often rely on our disciplinary camps and our uh, foundations that set up um, uh, barriers and obstacles. Uh, at the same time, I can get a sense from your presentation there's some strong um, conveyance of values as to what are we doing and how are we doing it. And I'm wondering to what extent have you relied on uh, bioethicists, uh, having bioethicists on staff? Do you rely on philosophers of science to look to, or is it really postmodern and you're developing it as you go along? Um, I, 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 I don't want to name any of the ethicists or philosophers that we work with because the mistakes are ours, right? Um, we have at various times, we, we at one point had a, an ethical advisory board for our cloud collaboration platform. We decided that that was mainly a fig leaf, right? Most of these things exist to validate the decisions that you've already made, right? You bring that, and we found we were doing that. Um, we run a yearly assembly where we invite uh, outside ethicists and philosophers and historians to come and talk with us uh, and talk to us and often critique us and lecture us. Um, that's the primary sort of formal method. I, you know, I, I come out of a philosophy background, and so um, you know, we, we have reading club where we look at you know, Polanyi and Firebend and a, a lot of the, the sort of classic philosophers of science. We've been bringing in more modern, more diverse philosophers of science over the last couple of years. Um, we, we view those as inputs. You know, we try to say, well, if, if this model for sharing is right and this model for ethics is right, what's a construct that actually instantiates them. So it's not sort of postmodern whatever we can do. We try to, but we, we also don't try to come in with, it, with the idea that we know the solution. We start from the scientific problem and we say, in many ways, we sort of watch what, what governance evolves and then we try to do type matching and say, ah, that's this form of governance that you're evolving. Here are the mistakes that are commonly made in that. Let's not make those, right? And, that's, and then we say, can we generalize out of that or is this just something that just worked for this group? Um, and so that's, does that make sense as a methodology? Um, but yeah, we work, uh, and, then, and then when we build, uh, and so my group leads the governance work. And so when we hit specific design points, we typically convene meetings of outside philosophers and ethicists to give us very specific feedback. So in the summer of 2014, we did that for our, at Academy Health here in DC for specifically the consent work. So we brought in, you know, people from the Berman Center. We brought in some some um, people who disagreed with the Berman Center, um, and uh, and then we sort of. And then I think I spoke to something like three thousand clinical professionals over a six week speaking tour, um, and I got the crap kicked out of me, which was and it made the product better. So so my group does more of that, uh, but we do try to do that pattern matching exercise to help convey why and how certain methods work in certain contexts. Because it's, it's funny, like, each of them are right at different times and places. Yeah. Sorry, back over there. Thanks, Jeff Patton, FDA. Um, the ARC GIS company, Esri, has a large effort to share data. And I was wondering if you're working with them. And if so, uh, how's that relationship? So uh, at Sage, we haven't worked with Esri yet. I know them through my dad, who was a geographer and, and spent a lot of time in the GIS spaces. 
Um, you know, Doug Richardson and, 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 you know, a lot of the folks who came out of real-time GIS and GPS mapping. Um, for the, the All of Us Research Program, I still call it the Precision Medicine Initiative, but for the, for the AOURP, um, there's been a triage process as we get towards national launch. Right. So we've been very focused on can the medical centers export their EHR data into a standardized format in ontology and upload it to the, the, the central repo? Um, does the blood make it to the blood bank within 24 hours, even when it comes from a rural site? You know, do the printers at the Walgreens have the capacity to print the labels on the, the pea cups? Right? It's, it's, it's incredible the amount of detail required to pull off this sort of distributed process. And so uh, I think a lot of the questions around data linkage, right, we've, we've, we've accounted for them in the clinical protocol. Uh, but I, if, if, there is, if there's a formal relationship out to ESRI and the JS community, so far I don't know of it. Um, but there, that may be happening in one of the working groups that is sort of uh, evolutionarily distant from the ones that I am baked into at the moment. Um, but I, I think you're going to see a pretty rapid push to begin doing data linkage and data connection once we get the architecture sort of humming and, and, and tested. You, you nailed the purpose of my question. Thank you for your answer. Sure. Oh. Thanks for the talk. That was great. I was just wondering who runs your ontology effort and is it published and open and how do I reuse it and connect? So we mainly use other people's ontologies. The vast majority of what we do is duct tape and gum. Okay, please use mine then. Sure. So I'm, I'll send I, an email on I, I, I'm a reminder that I run the governance team and I don't get to speak for the, the computer scientists and the computational biologists. Uh, but the, the vast majority of, of what we do is, uh, is grabbing existing structured work that's been done elsewhere. This is not, I actually come out of semantic web lineage, but uh, the group comes more out of a, of a, you know, just get the job done. Um, but when you work with six different Alzheimer's disease groups, you have to move to common systems. And so um, they tend to be done on a project by project basis. Um, and so we have, I think I, I would say we have heuristics more than we have ontologies. We have ways of using these things to connect things than we have you know, formal knowledge representation structures. But I'm happy to connect you to that group. Okay. So this is Patrick McMullen from Site Innovation. Um, I wanted to, to tap into your experience um, coercing people to, to work together and... Uh, <laughs> Encouraging, <laughs> coordinating. Going, going back to your definition of, of, of success in that regard, uh, you know, people opting in rather than being forced to do it. We had a part of the data visualization mini course we had yesterday, we followed it up with some discussion about uh, adoption of those techniques and how it's because it's hard to do, people, you know, why would people do it? Um, you know, if you could if you could make a, a a scatter plot in Excel and throw it into your manuscript, and that's sufficient to get it published, then then what's you know why why go through the process of doing something better? Right. I wonder if you have any any thoughts on how we could help incentivize that. I mean, it's amazing how money changes things. Um, I mean, th that's the thing that really struck me because I, I came into Sage having been an advocate. Right, I spent most of the aughts advocating for open science at Creative Commons. And uh, joining in, I sort of saw on the ground level how hard it really was to do to use all of these things, and and so you know you take like AMP AD as an example, and we've seen this pattern repeated where you know the RFA says you're going to have to collaborate, the grant agreements say you need to collaborate, the funder reinforces you have to collaborate. There's a coordinating center funded for the collaboration, and you still have to send 25 emails to get every data set posted in the portal. Right. And at the end of year one, the funder has to threaten certain of the scientists with not getting year two, which had to be in the contract. And that's after a filtering process where people had to apply to collaborate. Right? And it's, that's how hard the culture changes, and that's how alien some of the methodology changes are. Right? So you know, instead of doing the scatter plot in Excel, having that person working in a Python notebook that is connected to the Python notebooks of people in other laboratories. Right, that's, it's easy to say that. Just use a Python notebook, right? But the culture and methodology change required to make that useful to the PI right, is enormous. And so there, there's nothing like money and time to fix the problem. 
Because once a, once a large enough group of scientists is getting benefit from the resource, scientists are very sensitive to being outcompeted. And they will change methods in a heartbeat if they feel like the actual fastest way to get a group of scientists to change their culture is to make them feel like they're being left behind. The hardest thing is to create enough of a momentum that they feel that they're being left behind. So once you have that momentum, right, the Alzheimer's scientists are going to the Alzheimer's meetings and Society for Neuroscience and, and talking about their outcome and their productivity. People say, yeah, I want to be on the inside of that club, right? And so, so that's, the, that's the process that we've seen work. There may, I, I'm sure there are other such processes. Uh, but I have been shocked at the efficacy of, you know, create a lead group that is well enough resourced to survive sort of an agricultural value scale, you know, because it's it really is you know like a crop cycle. You've got to get through a couple of years of crops to see the benefit and the yield, and you've got to have the sort of the will and the time and the capacity to get through that, and then you have to have designed it back on day one to be joinable. And that's the other hard thing is a lot of things these things are designed where you fund the six labs and there's no provision for that to go to twenty, and so the you know, choices you make in day two can really affect efficacy on day day thousand, right? But that's when it's working is when the scientists that are in the area but not in the club feel left behind. And then they say, what do I need to do to join? And then all the grumpy people who needed 25 emails are like, well, here's how you share. You know? uh, but that's, that's winning, right? If you have to teach every group yourself, you're not, you're not teaching, right? Um, and scientists work that way. But we've, a lot of the stuff that we've done has sort of assumed that we can impose it from the top instead of growing it from the bottom. And I think you can fund it from the top and mandate it from the top, but you need to grow it out of these specific scientific problems and then let people join. And, and then they can generalize it for themselves instead of, you know, we do a lot of top-down design and it doesn't really fit a lot of scientists' daily needs. Is there one question over here? Braxton Lewis from Nobles. Uh, what about unique challenges in, in gaining access to occupational exposure uh, data? Uh, as an industrial hygienist, mm -hmm. I've, I mean, I've, I've taken and I've, I've input and I've looked at hundreds of thousands of different data sets that are not accessible outside of the workplace. And right. boy, does this need it. it, it, it it's, it's ripe, uh, but it's going to take a lot of negotiations, a lot of, a lot of discussions to, to get there. Yeah, no one has ever asked me that question and I've never thought about it. So I'm not going to make up an answer on the spot, but it's a really good question. Keep, the, keep it on the side. Yeah, of that's really interesting. So you mean like, you know, like keystroke logging data we've looked at, but we haven't looked at like environmental exposure at work. Yeah. I hate to cut things off, but I think it's time to move to our first session. Thank John Wilbanks.